in the book How Not to Be Wrong, I talk about a lot of mathematical notions, which on the one hand are not so complicated. They're simple to explain, but they're very broad in their application and deep in their meaning. And one of those things that I want to talk about right now uh, is the idea of expected value. And this is the fundamental way that mathematicians talk about the value of something whose true value is unknown or is subject to uncertainty, um, subject to some process of chance. So a typical example of such a thing, a lottery ticket. A lottery ticket is something that you buy and you don't actually know how much it's worth because you don't know whether it's a winner or a loser. So for instance, you could imagine a lottery ticket where there's a 1 in 100 chance that the lottery ticket comes with a $50 prize, but a 99 in 100 chance that the lottery ticket comes with no prize at all because the numbers are pulled out of the cage and they don't match what's on your ticket. Um, so what's the expected value of that lottery ticket? Well, here's one of these many places where mathematical terminology kind of diverges from the usual use of the English language because the value you expect that ticket to have is zero. That's by far the most likely outcome that the numbers pulled out of the cage will not match your ticket. Um, but that's actually not what we mean in mathematics by expected value. Uh, it might have been better if we were deciding on the notation from scratch to call it average value because what it really measures is if you had a lot of those tickets, let's say you bought one every day for a year, how much would they be worth on average? So if you bought 100 of those tickets, or if you bought 1,000, let's say, probably 10 of them would be winners, right? Because there's a 1 in 100 chance. Um, those 10 winners would give you $500 out of your 1,000 plays, so they would be worth, on average, 50 cents each. And that's what we mean by expected value. The expected value of the ticket is 50 cents. This, guy, this is why it's kind of a funny term, because 50 cents is not even a possible value that it might have. It might be worth nothing or it might be worth 50 bucks. Um, nonetheless, when we talk about its expected value, 50 cents is what we mean. And this is a very useful notion for determining how much you should rationally be willing to pay for the ticket. Because if that ticket costs you $2 to buy and you buy one every day, on average, you're going to be spending $2 and gaining 50 cents every one you do, and that is not a good bet. And that, in fact, is the way most real-life lotteries are structured. Um, in a sense, they kind of have to be that way, because if the average person was making money playing the lottery, then the state which won the lottery would be, on the average, losing money. And then there would not really be much point in the state doing it. So I write about this in the book, and when I was researching this, uh, figuring out what to say, I came across a rather interesting story. It was a story from the Boston Globe from 2012, and it was about a group of students at MIT who had found a way to win money reliably in the Massachusetts State Lottery. They won about three and a half million dollars. This is very strange because you're not supposed to be able to win the lottery even if you go to MIT because there's no real strategy in the lottery, right? You buy a ticket as a ticket. How on earth could they have been winning? So this seemed like a thread to pull. So um, I went and learned about this. It turned out that the Massachusetts Lottery had changed their rules People were getting discouraged. People hadn't been winning. People were, had stopped playing. So they changed the rules to make it seem like a better deal for the player. And when they did that, they did a little bit too good of a job. They actually made the game really be a good bet for the player. Um, only on certain days, not on all days. Um, but the MIT kids, and it turned out actually not just them, but other groups of people, had figured this out. And what ended up happening is that these large, these groups of bettors, including the MIT students, were buying hundreds of thousands of tickets at a time for each of these drawings, and they were actually comprising something like 80 to 90 percent of all the tickets that were bought. So the whole lottery had become kind of a private deal between the state of Massachusetts and these small groups of bettors. So this was an interesting story in several dimensions. The first thing I wondered when I was uh, reporting on this and studying it was, how did the state not figure out about this? I mean, like, the state knows who wins. They knows which tickets are paying out. So they could easily have seen that the same convenience store in Cambridge was reporting tens of thousands of winning tickets every time. That's sort of not a normal pattern that you might see by chance. Um, and when I dug into that, what I eventually figured out was that it's very simple to explain how the state didn't know. It's that the state actually did know. <laughs> which leads to another question. If the state did know, why did they not care that 
these guys were taking all this money? And the answer is that from the point of view of the state, the lottery is like a tax. The state gets 80 cents for every lottery ticket that's sold, and the state doesn't care who wins. It doesn't matter. The state takes its 80 cents, the rest of the money goes back out in prizes, and the state doesn't care who it goes to. So paradoxically enough, the fact that those guys were buying so many tickets was actually good for the state. They weren't taking money away from the state. They were taking money away from the other players. That was one puzzle. The second puzzle ended up taking me in a lot of surprising mathematical directions, which was this. The other groups of players, which were one group of a family from Michigan and then the Dr. Jong Lottery Club, which was a bunch of biochemists from the southern parts of Boston, um, they used what's called the Quick Pick Machine. Uh, it's a little computer that kind of just picks random numbers for you and will sell you however many tickets you want. The MIT kids did not do this. They chose their numbers and filled out their tickets by hand. 200,000 tickets. <laughs> That's a lot of work and you've got to ask yourself why they did that. Um, using the mechanism of expected value, every lottery ticket has the same expected value, so it shouldn't matter which tickets you choose. Why not just choose the random ones? Um, and this I found quite strange, so I spent a long time thinking about it, and what I eventually came to understand must have been the case. I did find these guys, but they wouldn't tell me, so then I got obsessed and I had to figure it out myself. Um, what I came to understand is that if the question is what's the expected value, what's your expected winnings on average, then it doesn't matter which tickets you have. But if you ask about risk, if you ask about how much variance in there is there and how much you might win, then which tickets you choose really does matter. And in fact, there's a way to choose the tickets that actually guarantees you that you cannot lose. So it's like not gambling at all in some sense. It's literally guaranteed payoffs. And that's quite important because after all, if you're buying 200,000 tickets, if you're sort of borrowing large sums of money from all your friends to go pay, play the lottery, um, you better be pretty sure you're going to win. You probably don't want to make that play, lose hundreds of thousands of dollars of your friend's money, and then say, well, mathematically speaking, on average, we'll eventually come out of the head. That's not such a great play for a bunch of college students to do. So um, in the book, um, this takes us through the realm of finite projective geometry, uh, perspective in painting, and eventually to uh, error correcting codes and the development of information theory, all by way of talking about a beautiful mathematical object called a combinatorial design, um, which you can use to select large groups of lottery tickets which are oh so cleverly arranged so that you are guaranteed to have so many winning combinations uh, that you can't actually lose money. As I said, I was never able to th get these guys to tell me what their strategy was, so I don't know if the combinatorial design I found is what they actually used. But if it isn't, I think it's what they should have used.